Right now, the government around the world is trying to fight the pandemic of COVID-19. And what we can learn from the case of Taiwan, which has been recognized as one of the most successful places in fighting with COVID-19. And right now, we have Digital Minister of the Executive Yuan, Taiwan, Audrey Tang, is joining us. Thank you, Audrey, for joining us. Hi, Audrey. Hello. How are you? Very well. Uh, okay. I was just uh, talking that uh, we can see each other very well with video conference. Uh, uh, compared to face to face with a mask, <laughs> we would need that if we come face to face, right? So, Andre, I, we would like to start by asking you whether it's still too premature to say that uh, Taiwan has won or at least is on its way to winning the war against the novel coronavirus, or is it too too early to celebrate? I think uh, what we can say is that we have a successful model so far. And we are willing uh, to help the world with the public health epidemic control capacities we're building. This is uh, not saying that we will continue to be as successful. Of course, we hope that we are. But what we're saying is that the measures that we're taking uh, is and can and is being successfully replicated elsewhere in the world. But the signs are po positive for you, right? The signs are positive, yeah, of course. Audrey, it would be very helpful, I mean, if you can take us back to the early stage of the fight against this virus. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, Gun Atam has mentioned that uh, Taiwan has been touted for its very successful uh, fight mm -hmm. against the, the, the virus. So, so can you take us back I mean, to see how, how you began um, to, to start fighting this virus. Okay, we started very early. We started last year, whereas most countries started this year. We started last year uh, when uh, the social media signals tells us something very unusual is happening uh, mm -hmm. in Wuhan. Uh, and so uh, we sent a team to investigate and discover signs of people-to-people, uh, -people, human to human transmission. Uh, we informed the WHO of that through email, uh, but it's not really heated until very late in the game. Um, but uh, we started taking the gut as if it's exactly the same as the SARS virus. Because you can see, uh, back in 2003, uh, we had the SARS uh, epidemic yeah. Yeah. and it uh, killed 37 people uh, in Taiwan. And we decided that 37 is too many. So we have a mobilization plan, including uh, complete legal and technical mechanisms and centralized decision making and efficient integration and coordination, which is what we discovered after SARS that what we needed all along. And so when this time happened, we treated um, without knowing anything about the new SARS uh, virus that uh -huh. is exactly the same as SARS. So we began very early on in monitoring at the airport, in making sure that everybody learns again about hand sanitation and mask wearing. Yeah. But you starting early could also be a problem because people might be suspicious as to why you, you need to be so less, less strenuous with all these measures, right? I'm sure there must be some question from the public. Uh, as actually for people who are above uh, a certain age, who are above 30 years old, uh, SARS is a collective memory and it's a painful memory. And so as soon as the government says this has the potential of being a human to human transmission and mutation of SARS, actually the uh, people clamored for the government to do more. The, the people complained, but they complained that we're not doing enough. Uh, <laughs> it's the, the other side of the problem. Uh, and so people complain that we should completely, for example, um, prevent air travel uh, between the entire PRC and Taiwan okay. and things like that. And we have to keep it a little bit balanced. I see. So the people were there supporting the government from the very beginning. Uh, they're, they're actually uh, making sure that the government delivers more uh, okay. when it comes to anticipating the outbreak. Because uh, in Taiwan, the social sector, the civil society is very robust and we have a very thriving journalistic community. And so the journalists, uh, just like detectives, serve as the early warning system. We rely on the journalist community to warn of the potential issues uh, when it comes to the outbreak. And so I think the journalistic community, in addition to the NHI system, to the central coordination system, is one of the heroes of the Taiwan playback. Minister Audrey, it was quite early response to the virus. How did you manage in terms of communications to the whole country? And did you see it as the long-term strategy or you saw it as emergency response in the beginning? Yes. So uh, we have a comprehensive counter-disinformation plan. 
uh, and the plan can be summarized in very simple three words. It's called uh, humor over rumor. Uh, and so we make sure that uh, the Ministry of Health and Welfare has a spokes dog. Uh, and so every day during the press conference, when the uh, Central Epidemic Control Center commander, the Minister of Health and Welfare, answers all the press conference questions and uh, he leaves no questions unanswered, he answers everything, relying on journalists as a partner. Right after the press conference, which is already translated into sign language and so on, it's translated into very simple picture cards by the folks dog uh, for MOHW, so that it can become very funny, we can add uh, some uh, mm -hmm. uh it makes people laugh about it, and so people uh, are willingly sharing this information, including mm -hmm. on how to wash their hands uh, properly and so on. And so this kind of uh, comic relief uh, both makes people more participatory, but also makes the ideas easier to remember. What was the most harmful type of uh, rumors or fake news around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in Taiwan, we, we say disinformation and rumor. We don't say uh, the F word because we don't want to alienate uh, journalists. Uh, so uh, the most harmful disinformation stems from uh, the idea that somehow people can, for example, there was a trending rumor that says uh, if you click share, uh, you can get a, a box of masks for free, sponsored supposedly by a mask manufacturer. So this is a scam, actually, uh, phishing, uh, that uh, it's making sure that people who uh, are, are not sure where the mask supplies are, um, and they entail that they uh, share their pri private information. Of course, none of the people who share receive masks, but they may receive instead computer virus. Uh, and so this is actually uh, very harmful. And the way to counter this, in addition to a very funny pneumatic message, is just to work with the civil society so that everybody can view with their phone, uh, looking at a real map, a real-time map, and see which pharmacies near them still have uh, masks in store, in stock. And so they can just collect uh, collect uh, nine masks uh, for adults and ten uh, starting tomorrow, and they can see the stock level drop by nine or ten, and verifying that this is a participatory ledger that holds everybody accountable. And so they will not fall um, into victims into the online scam that uh, lures them into sharing their private information. So overall, Taiwan didn't have trouble of mask shortage at all. So at the very beginning, we used to have, uh, because our production capability uh, was not enough at the time, we have maybe a million and a half um, mm -hmm. a day, but now we are uh, 10 times that number. Uh, we produce um, easily 15 million a day. Um, and so that, uh, although it is not like completely the same number as the number of Taiwanese citizens, we are 23 million people after all, uh, but with uh, some creative way of uh, prolonging mass use, uh, we can satisfy most of our everyday needs. Yes. So to, to wear or not to wear masks has never been a question in Taiwan, right? Unlike in some other Western countries where you would debate whether or not people on the street should wear masks or not. There's a uh, widely cited study, uh, not only in WHO, but in other health circles, that if people wear masks, but they don't know how to wash hands properly, then it's maybe counterproductive because people may feel a sense of safety, but uh -huh. actually they touch their uh, mouth and touch their face yeah. even more. Uh, but instead of saying, oh, we cannot trust the people, so we could say maybe not uh, very much, we are yes. saying, you know, what we should do is to make hand sanitation a very trendy, very hip thing to do. And mm -hmm. so uh, we have uh, like lyrics and rhymes and songs uh, like Nei Wai Da Gong Da Li Wan, which is the seven uh, syllable that everybody remembers on how to wash their hands properly and so on, mm -hmm. ensuring that mask use is safe to recommend to people. Obviously, Taiwan has done a lot and done it quite early. What's the latest situation, Audrey, right now in Taiwan? Can you really say that it's under control? Yeah, the latest situation uh, very clearly uh, put is that people are feeling calm about it. And this is the most important thing. People are feeling that they know uh, daily via the press conference. For example, today uh, we have three more cases uh, and two of them are from abroad visitors. Yesterday we have three confirmed cases, all of them are from abroad visitors and so on. And so the numbers are really transparent and we know that uh, the contact tracing works really well so that all of the uh, visitors, if they happen to overlap, 
uh, with the other people uh, by way of mobile phone signal of the major telecoms, uh, the contact tracing can anticipate uh, who need to be um, PCR tested and so on. And so it's a very predictable system. I wouldn't say that uh, it is uh, like completely a success, but I'm saying that people are generally feeling very confident that the contact tracing system is working as intended. In, in crisis like this, uh, Audrey, trust in the government is very important. You mentioned about how authorities in, in your country have been straightforward and truthful with, with, uh, in answering questions uh, regarding to the situation. What other factors do you think have contributed to building trust in the government? Yes, um, so in Taiwan, we always say that the government should first trust the citizens with open data, with journalistic access and so on, and then the people can trust back. We're not asking for blind trust. We're earning for the citizens' trust. Two other factors, in addition to this trust and working with journalism, I think are important. The first is that there's a very accessible national single-payer healthcare, the NHI system, that covers the entire population, as well as most of the migrant workers, uh, as well as foreign uh, people residents in Taiwan. And this ensures that people will happily go to a clinic if they show a symptom wearing a mask, they will not think about, oh, this would cost me a fortune, or this uh, is very unpredictable, and so on. They know that the national health system will cover uh, for everything, uh, including the free tests that are needed uh, for uh, it to be all negative before they can get the hospitalized if they do get uh, a confirmed case. So the NHI system is very important, that's the first one. The second one is that uh, the political um, command system is very uh, interesting because the um, head of uh, the CDC, the commander, is advised by our vice uh, president, uh, Dr. Chen Jianren. And Dr. Chen Jianren literally wrote the textbook used in Taiwan on epidemiology. So he is both a scientific authority and a political authority. So there can be no one that overrules when it comes to the public health decision. Okay, and he yeah. reads all the papers and published by himself. Okay. Sp speaking oh. with full authority on this subject. <laughs> Audrey, but in this crisis like this, you said you have to earn trust from Taiwanese population. But what's the issue of the dilemma between national security and privacy issue? How do you draw the line and still earn trust from people? Yes. So uh, we make uh, sure that we have a legal basis that we tell people if you are, for example, under home quarantine, then your mobile phone signals will be monitored by the um, telecom and there is no opt-in nor is there an opt-out. It is just something that you're informed that uh, we're building the digital fence system. But once you're outside of the quarantine, then we no longer have the legal basis to run the system. And this is, again, very clearly communicated uh, as of how it works and why it works. And so going uh, fully transparent about the whereabouts of the system from the designer's viewpoint, fully communicating the ramification to the journalists, I think that is also very important uh, to build public trust. So I'm not saying that everybody agrees with that. 91% uh, of people support the CECC measure. That means 9% of people still don't uh, support these measures. And we're not resting on our laurels. We're making sure that we come uh, even um, uh, more advanced technologies to prevent um, you know, the privacy harms that may cause uh, by this uh, new norm. I see. Uh, Audrey, uh, my country, Thailand, is now under a partial lockdown and under a six-hour curfew. And still people still have problems complying with all these restrictions imposed so far. So what, what about in, 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 in Taiwan? What kind of restriction do you have and how cooperative people have been in complying with these, uh, these, uh, these measures? At the present stage, uh, we're mostly uh, advising social distancing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so for indoor meeting, uh, we have to be one meter and a half across. For uh, outdoor, it's one meter across. And people are working very well uh, to comply, actually even more strict uh, than the government guidelines. The government says uh, wearing a mask and you can waive this uh, social distance. So people are keeping the social distance even when wearing a mask. <laughs> what about travel, the commuting, the daily commuting by the people? Is now it everything being restricted? Is normal. Everything no. is normal. Is it normal? People can go to work. During the day. Yeah, if they can work, uh, we, we still have school, school open. 
we understand that uh, we're one of the like six counties that still yeah. have all the levels yeah. of food yeah. open. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What about you? Are you working from home <laughs> or you just go to the office like normal days? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the administration. I'm in the cabinet uh, building in the executive unit right now and using the uh, teleconferencing software. Yesterday, we just found Zoom, uh, and so we have to teach all the interviewers that want to use Zoom how to mm -hmm. switch the software. That also took some time. Mm -hmm. yeah, but does the pandemic have any, any immediate impact on the economy and business sectors in, in Taiwan? Well, obviously, for air travel and tourism uh, okay. and everything that depends on the service industry, it's, it's been very hard hit. Uh, and we've had special budgets that allocate a significant portion of the GDP to make sure that they can uh, keep them afloat mm. still in the air. Uh, uh, when the uh, coronavirus situation uh, clears, we want to make sure that people, uh, after taking this time, not entirely off, but use this opportunity to do digital transformation to get used to uh, the online kind of working. Uh, and then they can serve uh, their original customers, but in addition to that digital online customers as well. Mm. What, what kind of lessons from your experience that you think you can share with countries like Thailand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, clear and timely policy communication is the single best thing that we are uh, sharing with the world, including acute folks dog, very important and partnership with the journalism community because the journalism community serves as the accountability branch that uh, warrants everything in advance. And do you but still have yeah, press yeah. briefing? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Do you still have daily press briefing nowadays to communicate no, with people? So of course, and sometimes uh, twice a day. But mostly people look forward to the daily press conferences mm -hmm. and they can also type uh, during the live uh, chat in the YouTube chat room. What, what have been the more critical questions from the media community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, many media community nowadays uh, are asking the Central Epidemic uh, Control Center uh, what is the uh, um, like worst case scenario? Are we prepared for a worst case scenario? So far, we have only very likely uh, exercised uh, this very advanced uh, like uh, widespread community threat. And it's a bit of luxury, of course. But the media is also thinking that maybe we're living life uh, in a much more true, relaxed manner. <laughs> it's, uh, civil society. It's too good it's, to be true. <laughs> the seriousness of the situation. Uh, and if we do have a community respiratory outbreak, is the clinics going to be uh, overwhelmed uh, because everybody uh, doesn't have the psychological preparation for it? Or are we still mobilized enough, strong and resilient enough if that day happens? That's the most pertinent question. Audrey, you are digital minister, and how do you see the future of the world after this pandemic has finished? The future of mm -hmm. work, future of economy, how do you see it? Okay, so I first want to say that I need to attend to another meeting, maybe one minute from now, <laughs> but I will just take a couple of minutes and then I will dial back, uh, okay. and so I'll break shortly. But I think uh, this kind of multitasking it's unimaginable before COVID, right? If I'm in your studio, I cannot say that, oh, I have an emergency call, and then I will <laughs> wait a minute, and then I will reappear magically in the studio. Okay. But because of the digital tools, this kind of multitasking is becoming the norm in everyday work. And so people are getting used to how to uh, clear their preconceptions about, for example, video conferencing being very blurred. Uh, being very laggy, being very low quality. But now, uh, when, as we can see now, it's very high quality and I can see it perfectly. Uh, and so it clears people's preconceptions about video conferencing. So Audrey, the pandemic has again brought up the question of Taiwan's role in international organizations. And of course, in this present context, in the World Health Organization. So how do you think the aftermath of this pandemic will mm -hmm. help in Taiwan's role? I know Taiwan has been eager, and in fact, it is doing a lot in helping the world coping with this, this pandemic. So you think the whole thing will have a positive effect on Taiwan's role in the future? Definitely, and it's not just that Taiwan can help. Taiwan is already helping. Through a series of joint statements and uh, bilateral collaborations, uh, we are contributing to the global health uh, community already. Mm -hmm. um, but what we want to say uh, specifically is how we work with the social sector, 
the private sector, at the academia and the journalistic community. I think that part of cross-sectoral collaboration, instead of everything relying on one single central command, is the main model that we want to share. And already in Thailand, uh, I joined uh, a workshop run by PBS, and uh, later on, a workshop by the Jurong Goyang University, talking about exactly this kind of data collaboration. <laughs> And so okay. I think uh, this kind of collaboration is what we want to share in the world. And maybe the multilateral organizations can learn from this kind of multi-stakeholder collaboration even more. Okay. Thank you very much, Audrey Truong, for okay. joining us and for your time. We know that you are very busy, but we have learned a lot from you and from Taiwan. Thank you very much. Thank you, and Thank keep you. safe. So that's coming from... Audrey Tang, and she showed how Taiwanese government has been very agile in coping with the COVID-19 very early on, even before Wuhan has announced to lock down the whole city. And that's because Taiwan has quite experience in SARS in 2003 and how to cope with it.